It's a story about a chassid who came to the Tzemach Tzedek, the third Rebbe, and he said to him that I would like to make Aliyah. I'd like to go live in Israel. So the Tzemach Tzedek said to him, Mach do Eretz Yisrael. Instead of going to the land of Israel, and that will be your Aliyah, make the land, make the environment in which you live, make this land into Eretz Yisrael. Turn this place into Israel. Which is quite a concept, because what does that mean? Mach do Eretz Yisrael. Make where you live now Eretz Yisrael. I mean, you daven. And in the davening, every single morning and every single afternoon, we say Hashem in a whole lot of different ways. Hashem, please take us back to the land. Gather in the exiles, reestablish your sovereignty in Jerusalem, take us back. We should see with our own eyes the reconstruction of your base Hamikdash. So, what do you mean, Machdo? Make this into Israel. What do you mean, make this into Israel? The goal is to get to Israel, surely. Also, in, a, in addition to that, we're told that we're living very much on the threshold of Mashiach. This is really, really the time of Mashiach. And we know that when Mashiach comes, we're going to Israel. Whatever that means. If it means that you should be uh, investing right now in, in real estate, <laughs> or if it's coming as part of the package deal, free apartments, however Mashiach is going to work it out. So what, why would you now focus on Mahda Eretz Israel? Make where you are now Israel? Well, why would you do that? When you get to Israel, you'll be in Israel. So in this week's parasha, one of the things that we're going to read is about how they divided the land between all of the tribes. Because we're at the point now in the Torah where they're literally about to enter into the land of Israel. And in order to, let it, to enter into the land of Israel, one of the things that they needed to do is they needed to determine which tribe is going to be given which portion of land. So, 40 years earlier, which we read about in the parasha a couple of, whatever, three weeks ago, we had the story of the spies. The spies were supposed to go and search, the, check the land, see what it's uh, all about, see what the strategic approach is that they should take. All of that was supposed to have happened prior to this. Now, at this point... The Jews are about to go into Israel. They're going to cross the Jordan, they're going to conquer Jericho, and they're going to take over the land. So we see that there's this principle, and we've spoken about this already before, this principle of conquering the land. Hashem didn't just give the Jewish nation the land of Israel. He dafka first gave it to the Canaanite nations, and then he instructed us that we should conquer the land and take it from the Canaanite nations. And when we learned about this previously, we determined that this is all in addition to what actually happened historically, but it's all metaphoric for our own spiritual development. That we have a land that we live in. The land of our own personality, the land of our own thinking, and of course the physical environment that we live in. And in its raw state, it's a land of Canaan. That means to say in its raw state, the people who occupy this land, whether it be the land of my mind, the land of my heart, or the land of the physical environment that I live in, in its raw state, the people who occupy this land have very different ideas about what's important to what the Torah would want. Who occupies the land? Lust, temptation, vices, anger, laziness. That's who occupies the land. And so the goal of a Jewish person is to conquer the land, to transform the land from being a place that is loose, misguided, undirected, and to turn it into a place that is Eretz Yisrael. It wants to do what Hashem wants. That's our goal. That is our internal goal. It's the way we're supposed to influence ourselves. And it is our goal of our environment. Meaning to say, if everybody would up and leave and go live in Israel, it would be wonderful for us. And it would be an objective and a goal for us as individuals and as a Jewish community. But it would miss a part of the objective which Hashem has, that is, to also elevate and transform the world around us. You know, they say that a Jewish person should never be what is called a tzaddik in pelts. You know what that is? A tzaddik in pelts. A pelt is a fur coat. When a person's cold, so there are two ways that you can deal with it. The one way is you go and you bring out your fur and you wrap up warmly and you say, oh, beautiful. 
I feel amazing. And everybody else still has chattering teeth all around you. But if you light the fireplace, then everybody is warmed. So a Jewish person is not supposed to be a tzaddik in pelts, meaning to say a tzaddik, a righteous individual, only with regards to myself. I'm looking out for myself. I need to have a certain experience. I need to have a certain exposure to holiness. I need to have a certain connection to God. As long as I'm okay, we're all good. No, that's not how it works. The job is to warm the environment. The job is to touch others. The job is to influence, to inspire, to elevate, to upgrade. You cannot be satisfied with your own spiritual progress if other people are still left out in the cold. So this idea of conquering the land of Israel, Machdo Eretz Israel, make here into Israel, means that every one of us is given our little piece of the, of the world, our little piece of history, our personal sphere of influence, and that's where we're supposed to bring that consciousness of Israel, that awareness of Hashem, that connection to Hashem. That's what we're supposed to do. That's called Kivosh Eretz Yisrael, the conquering of Israel. And that's what's described in this week's parasha. And the first thing that we see is that the land had to be split up between the 12 tribes. That's quite insightful because that tells you straight away, if you know the, the geography of Israel, you'll know. That it's a very diverse country in spite of its tiny size. It's very environmentally diverse. Some areas are lush and coastal. Others are arid desert. You have the Hermon up north. And you have the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth. You have places that are forested. And you have places that are rocky. So can you imagine you're at that point. You're standing in the desert. You've been told that shortly you and everybody around you is going to enter this land and everybody will be allocated a piece of the land. You can well imagine what people are thinking. Well, I really hope I get a nice, a good piece of land, you know. I hope that I get where the oil is. Somehow that didn't seem to happen. You know, I, I want to get where the climate is good. Not, not necessarily that sticky summer of Tel Aviv. I'd, maybe I'd, I'd rather have the, the cooler Jerusalem uh, breeze. Yeah, I can imagine. And you can imagine what it is when you have a whole lot of people and those people happen to be Jewish. You can imagine what's going on. Have you ever seen what goes on when the Pesach range of cottage cheese comes out? See how people jostle each other just to be able to get that tub of cream cheese. Can you imagine? Now you're talking about what will be the territorial heritage of your family forever? You can only imagine what was going to go on over there. So how did they resolve it? They made a goyrol. A goyrol is a lottery. And effectively, the start of the goyrol was, and it's a, they're multi-layers, but the start of the goyrol was that they took the name of each major family within each tribe. They wrote the name on a piece of paper. And on another piece of paper, they wrote an, a territorial area and they pulled out, like, I don't know if you've ever seen, we do that sometimes when we do a, a raffle. So you pull out a name and you put out a corresponding piece of paper with a territory and that's it. You've got it. And we're told that that girl, that lottery was divinely inspired. So nobody could argue about it afterwards because... You had Elazar, who was at that point the Kohen God or the high priest. He stood there with the breastplate, which had the Urim Batumim, this mystical feature that allowed communication from Hashem. And it endorsed every single territorial al allocation. So nobody could argue about it. What you were given is what you were given. And that way, two things happened. Firstly, it settled any potential argument. Because who are you going to argue with? You're going to argue with Moshe? Moshe says, it wasn't me. You stood there. You watched me draw the lots. You saw what happened. It was guided by Elazar. There was divine intervention. That's it. You can't fight. But something deeper also happened. Because that was a message to each tribe as to what their means of connection to Hashem would be. Because if your territory is in a particular area, and therefore there's a particular kind of lifestyle that you could live there. Let's say you had a coastal territory, so you're more likely to deal with merchants who come from abroad. Or let's say that you had a very lush territory, you were more likely then to, to um, grow livestock. Or let's say that you were in an area where you have the beautiful grape valleys of, uh, of the Negev. So, uh, sorry, not of the Negev, of the Galil. 
you, you know, the northern Israel, where they have the magnificent grape producing, so then you know that Hashem expects of you that that's what you should be doing. If your portion was in Jerusalem, then you know that you had to do something, obviously, with either the leadership or the spiritual service of the Jewish people. So not only were you allocated land and you couldn't fight about it, but you were given an insight into what your spiritual connection is all about. Because the nature of your environment would relate to your spiritual connection. And there were 12 major areas of that spiritual connection because we're told that there are 12 major areas or 12 major channels of how we connect to Hashem. There's one feature of this lottery though that was very interesting. The Torah tells us, Al pi ha Now if you translate that phrase, you have two ways to translate it. You could either translate it very literally which would be a strange translation, or you could translate it colloquially, which would be a more common translation. So the colloquial translation would be al pi based on the results of the lottery, that's how they split the land between everybody. The literal translation would be al pi by the mouth of the goyrol, of the lottery, that's how they split the land. So Rashi says, al pi tells us, that in addition to the fact that Elazar the high priest was there, and there was this divine influence, as they pulled out each piece of paper, you can imagine only those who were in the closest environment could read what was on the paper. So as they pulled it out, Hashem did a miracle, and the piece of paper announced what was written on it. That way nobody could debate. That way nobody could complain that this was rigged, because it's miraculous. Clearly, if it's miraculous, you know that it's directly from Hashem, and you have to accept it. So that raises an interesting question. We have a principle which says, Hashem never does miracles for no good reason. He's not a show-off. He doesn't do miracles just to alert us to what his abilities are. If Hashem chooses to do a particular miracle, it's for a reason. What's the reason that he wanted this miracle? Why well, He could have had, I don't know, some... Cloud writer, you know, okay, so they didn't have planes in those days, but have some words emblazoned across the horizon that say, this portion to this person, or this group. Why did the Goral, the actual piece of paper, have to speak? It's such a strange and an unexpected miracle. Why? And that we'll have to pick up tomorrow. <laughs>